Oh my lord. Carl, and the Department of Interior on Thursday. Um, so this training will uh, we'll do this training and then you'll have a little break, a 30 minute break, and we're gonna reconvene and you'll have time to practice your stories with your group, with your um meeting group for tomorrow. Um and do some research and yeah. You might have some time during, but yeah, I'll pass it over to Brad. He's awesome. Some of you may know him already. Let me help situate it up here because we want to make sure that those people who are joining us remotely will have the opportunity to get this content as well. Um, I am delighted to be back here. Uh, in fact, I was just almost with you yesterday in some form because uh, I was doing a training program on the webinar. I'm having the events back in the district of state. Uh, my name is Brad Fitch. I'm with the Correctional Management Foundation. For a uh, little bit about me and my organization. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, the only one with 100% resources from people dedicated to improving democracy by improving the Congress and improving the relationship citizens have with the United States Congress. Uh, we do these training programs for groups like yours, over 100,000 Americans have participated in our programs, but we also work directly with the United States Congress. Trying to improve our democracy through building better offices and building a better institutions. I've been affiliated with the United States Congress for 36 years. I'm one of those kids that came here on a school bus trip from a little town in upstate New York in the rural area of New York State and fell in love with our capital. And so I've been here starting as a television reporter, 13 years on Capitol Hill, 17 years affiliated with the Congressional Management Foundation, 12 as its CEO. And today, we're going to deliver to you some content that's going to help you build your story for delivering to the members of Congress and their staffs. Now, this is a very different training program that you've been in the past because we're going to be asking you to think about opening up to your members of Congress and staff, telling them your history, your family history. Sometimes that can be difficult, but our research and all the research on storytelling and on the psychology and neuroscience of persuasion is that this is the most effective tool in a citizen advocate's toolkit. So let's get started. Why storytelling? Well, it's because storytelling helps persuade and helps people understand context and understanding, especially when it comes to translating and connecting issues or pieces of legislation to people. The Congressional Management Foundation regularly surveys congressional staff. A few years ago, we asked this question. How helpful is it for the following for messages from constituents to include the following? And this is what we found out is 79% of congressional staff said it was helpful or very helpful to have a personal story. But then we did a follow-up question with congressional staff and asked this right here. How frequently do messages from constituents include the following? See how I'm going here? Is if you have something that is very helpful, but it's in frequency, you're going to differentiate. You're going to have something that other people don't have. And what we found out from our survey was that while 79% of congressional staff said it was helpful or very helpful to have a personal story, only 18% said they did it frequently or very frequently. Let me illustrate the value of storytelling, but sort of teaching from the negative method, meaning this is not the way I want you to do it. This is the story of an at-risk youth from a blended family in the farm bill, suffered from a head trauma, uh, an extreme weather event, undertakes a high-risk journey to a distant urban center, accompanied by three homeless adults, briefly struggles with an opiate addiction, and is pursued by a malevolent person. Can anyone guess what this story is? Probably not because I didn't tell it that well. It is the Wizard of Oz. That's not how to do it. <laughs> we like to think of ourselves as rational beings, as thinking beings. One neuroscientist said we are not thinking beings. We are emotional beings that occasionally think. We like to think of ourselves as people that look at a problem, we study the problem, and then we come up with a solution. Yet the reality is that's not how our brains are wired. In reality, we see something, we feel something, and then we decide. 
And that's how things are done. That's how we work. And it's this emotional connection that is so important in a persuasive process because it's their emotion that we connect to an audience or we connect to a legislative page to an issue. You know that when you're telling your story and you're feeling emotions, that you're actually having a biochemical, neurochemical reaction in your brain. And the audience is feeling the same thing. It's like a healthy mind. It's amazing that you're able to actually change the neurochemistry of your audience when you tell the story well. But it's a little challenging in these days and age because our attention span has gotten shorter and shorter. In the 1980s, we might have had an attention span of 22 seconds. Move that to the 2000s, and our attention span dropped to maybe 12 seconds. Even move it to today or close to today, and it's down with social media, down to nine seconds. No, I am wrong. Actually, nine seconds is the attention span of a goldfish. We actually have an attention span now that's closer to 2.8 seconds. So your challenge is creating a story that's going to get the attention of lawmakers and staff. So what we're going to do here today is we're going to talk about the elements of basic storytelling. I'm going to walk you through the seven elements of basic storytelling. I'm then I'm going to play a story for you, and we're going to reverse engineer that story. We're going to listen to the story and see how the seven elements are then played out. You're then going to practice your story a little bit. I'm delighted we got more time later today because to do this right, you've got to really rehearse this about four or five times. Yeah, that's right. You get it right. The first time, said another way, the first time you're telling your story to a United States Senator should not be when you're standing in front of a United States Senator. You should practice it in advance and you'll get good at it if you take this time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about elements of storytelling. First, you're going to begin with the end in mind. You're going to be keeping in mind what you want to tell, where you want that audience to go. You want to think about what the groundwork you're going to lay for that story. Now, you're going to be given some talking points and some guidance on what your teachings are. So you're going to know what that is. But it's important that as a storyteller, you know where the is going. Then, the first element of storytelling is setting the stage it's finishing this sentence and filling in these blanks congresswomen women if you don't do x y will happen so you want to set the stage now a little extra bonus i didn't tell you about this in order to illustrate this story and this uh training program i'm going to be showing you some movie clips from movies that illustrate the different elements and you'll see how they work out. And the first clip I'm going to show you is from Lincoln, where Lincoln, in this case, sets the stage for passing a constitutional amendment which would abolish slavery. Now, maybe the fate of human dignity is not in your hands. <laughs> Hopefully not. But the point is that you're laying out the stage of what is at stake. So here are some tips to consider how to do that. First, oops, going on. Work your first sentence. Think about what that first sentence is going to be. I gave you a little bit of a tip of if we don't do X, Y will happen. That's one way of looking at it. Establish the context for what you're going to describe. What is at stake for a patient, for a family, for you, for your friends, other people in your community? It's okay to be tough. It's okay to make them feel like 
a lot of that thing. Because frankly, a lot is. The issues that you're often talking about, whether it's the environment, whether it's dreamers, you got a lot going on. These are not softball issues. And so it's okay to lay it out for that lawmaker or that staff member that something very serious is at stake. Now, next, element number two is paint the picture, the details. What did you hear? Smell, see, feel. Use adjectives. This is part of the storytelling process that many people leave out. And it's a mistake. Because again, it allows you to embellish and advance the story in a special way. The clip I'm going to share with you is actually from a really terrific movie. If you haven't seen it, it's Apollo 13. Of course, Apollo 13, Tom Hanks, and he's played Jim Lowell, the commander of Apollo 13, when they had an accident. And don't worry, it's a happy ending to get back early. Um, or, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. Um, and in this particular scene, the accidents happen. This family is driven into the TV and they're replaying a clip, an interview they did with Captain Jim Lowell, and he paints a picture. So it wasn't that very busy just coming here and listening to the story and listening to the way he described the green algae and flipping off the mat like he was being in the dark with him. Think about how you're going to tell your story that way when you're meeting with an elected official. Um, maybe you have a, to use a move term to mark those importances that you want to tell, or your parents' story, or something like that. That's going to be gripping. They want to hear every detail. Um, as I said, what did you see, smell, hear, taste? Remember to use adjectives and to be graphic. A few years ago, I was doing this training program for emergency nurses, and the issue they're focused on is workplace safety. By the way, the most dangerous place to work in America is an emergency department because people are coming in all hours, sometimes high, and they were trying to get legislation passed that would create uniform workplace safety laws for emergency departments all throughout the country. And this woman after, was doing this same training program, came to me afterwards and said, should I show them this? This is a picture of my friend who was beat up by a patient who came to the emergency department and she just black and blue, bloody in the face. I said, I'll never forget this picture. By the way, it happened five years ago, and I'll never forget that photo. So it's okay to be graphic. It's okay to tell details on how something happened. That's what they're looking for. Because most of the meetings that they have on a daily basis are boring. <laughs> it's not, I mean, you, you, you show interest because in they're constituents, but it's really hard sometimes to show interest. Okay. The next element, number three, is the struggle. And this can be internal, psychological. In some of the cases, you do have opponents on some of your legislation. There are people who are opposed to your boss. Sometimes it's just a class where you're trying to get funding for something and you're competing with other groups. The clip that I'm going to show you that illustrates the struggle uh, comes from the movie Selma, where this actor is betraying Dr. Martin Luther King and advocating for the Voting Rights Act. As long as I am able to exercise my constitutional right to vote, I do not have command of my own life. I try to determine my own destiny, but in determined from it, I think it would want to see something to see. 
Obviously, you can feel the struggle by watching that clip. And aren't you drawn into the movie? Aren't you drawn into the story because of how the struggle is described? Well, that's what we want you to do when you're describing the conflict. Identify what is the conflict that you're struggling with. And again, it could be internal, it could be external. But you want to have that tension. Every great story has a protagonist, has a hero or heroine struggling to succeed. You, your family member, the community, you are that hero. Now, not every story has a surprise, but great stories have some kind of discovery. There is some kind of moment where you are surprised by what you're hearing. I was doing this training program with a group of patient advocates, and they had brought a doctor along with them. And the doctor was doing a role play with me and was describing in very detail the impact of this disease on an individual. And he finished his story with a surprise. He said, and Congressman, the reason I know so much about this is I have this disease too. He hadn't told me that. It changed my perspective. There was a before and after moment for me as an audience. There was before looking at him as a physician, and there was after looking at him as a patient. And it just changed my perspective on the story. Now, the clip hopefully is not a spoiler for you. It's coming from The Empire Strikes Back, where there was a really big discovery in this one. What we've learned. Nunca te dijo que pasó con tu padre. Me dijo lo suficiente. Él me dijo que tú lo mataste. No. Yo soy tu padre. It's a good time again. So again, if you, some stories aren't there where you're able to bring it out. But what did you learn? There is, again, this before and after moment when the discovery happens. Sometimes the discoveries are big. You're going to hear in the sample program that or uh, story I played you in a minute. Um, there's a couple of surprises that happen. Now, the next element, um, the fifth element in storytelling is required in that you have to introduce the potential of success and joy. Success is when the heroine or hero wins. Joy is when the audience participates. How many of you the first time you saw Star Wars A New Hope and the Death Star was exploded? Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, you clapped. You, you participated in that experience. That's what you want. You mm -hmm. want to draw that audience member in, that member of Congress in. Now, the clip I'm going to show you is from the movie Animal House. This is no longer an appropriate film to short children. I don't know how many of you know this film, but this is film is not aged well. But this last clip has been used in a lot of training programs, and it does show us what happens when a speaker tries to bring in and draw an audience to participate in joy and success. Walking around the skin. Look
Okay, this is where it's going to But the principle is you want to introduce the possibility of joy and success. So you want to finish this sentence for the lawmaker, Congresswoman. We have the opportunity to. How does that sentence end? We have the opportunity to allow millions of Americans who want to be part of our society, dreamers, be part of that society. We have the opportunity to create an environment for my generation and the generations to follow that will sustain the planet. And we have the opportunity to. You're listening, the members listening for that because that's their cue of like, oh, this is the bill they want me to go sponsor. This is the vote they want me to take. This is the cause they want me to champion. Now, the last element, I learned something uh, interesting about. When we were designing this program, I actually found a consultant that had a background in advocacy, and he was a failed actor. And so he was a perfect consultant for this. And he introduced me to a term I had never heard. The last line in a movie script is called the button. And so that's what we want you to do is finish with a hook, have a powerful line at the end. One of the best trainings I got and did with a group was another patient advocacy group, which is the National MS Society. And we had gone through these rehearsals and they had prepared clearly in advance because Eminem was doing role playing with me. And I could tell he was a big, tall, black American, but he was confined to a wheelchair. He was a former Air Force sergeant, very proud, clearly. And this is how he role played. And this was his book. This was his Latin. He said, Congressman, before I left for this trip, I said goodbye to the joy of my life. My four year old granddaughter. She called me Baba. And she asked me this question Baba, when will your hands stop shaking? Congressman, what should I tell her? That was it. He just left it there on the table, and that was it. It was awesome. That's what you want. You want them contemplating, thinking about that last question. When they call their spouse at the end of their day at 11 o'clock at night, you want them retelling your story and saying, you know, I had this really interesting story and meeting with a young person from Yuma that really surprised me how well they told their story. That's the metric you want. You want that lawmaker to retell that story, your story, to their family. And of course, the clip that has a lot of good last lines in the movie, but we're going to go from that. Let me start. Now, one last element. As I say, if you want to rehearse this, you want to write it out, you want to wait to the last moment to deliver it. This is something that's practice. You're shaking the member's hand and about to say goodbye, and what line are you going to use that's going to make you the most memorable person that they met on that given day? That's the challenge I'm giving you for your meetings. Now, there's one other important element I referenced it earlier. You need to practice. Just a little break. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse engineer a story. And this is a story of a boy named Aiden. And he's stories being told by his mom. Now, these are elements of storytelling. I'm going to keep them up so you can look at them and listen to those elements as Aiden's mom tells his story. It's only about two and a half minutes, but just see how much she gets back in in two and a half minutes. How long does it take you to eat lunch? While well, most kids eat lunch quickly and run off to play, my son Aiden usually has to spend the entire lunch hour carefully chewing. My son's name is Ian. He is 13 years old and lives in Slater, Wisconsin. He enjoys basketball and spending time with his friends. However, he has a rare disease called ectodermal dysplasia, which causes him to miss out on his favorite activities. His condition causes him to overheat easily due to his issues with sweat glands. His skin is very sensitive and he needs to use medicated creams to prevent rashes and infections, and he is missing many of his teeth. He has issues with chewing food properly and has had to go through many unnecessary medical procedures 
including swaddling studies and an endoscopy, all because of missing so many teeth. He is often left sitting at lunch, chewing slowly and trying to finish his, finish his lunch while his classmates are out at recess. In the past, when he finally went out to play, he faced bullying because he had trouble being understood. It took over three years of speech therapy for Aiden to be able to speak clearly and make it possible for our family, his classmates, and his teachers to understand his speech. We have had to fight to get him his treatment because the repair and placement of these missing teeth are usually viewed as cosmetic, even though it is repairing a congenital anomaly. If Aiden had been in an accident, his missing teeth would have been covered by insurance. Families can pay an average of $150,000 over a lifetime to give their children teeth. Families like mine have to choose between sending their kids to college, paying their mortgage, and affording basic necessities, or allocating those same funds for their children to have teeth. By passing the Ensure Investing Smiles Act also, Congress has the opportunity to help other children in your district like Aiden. Help them will help families like ours by ensuring that medical insurance plans cover the repair of congenital anomalies such as those that affect my son. How far do you think you would get without teeth? Now, before I deconstruct this in reverse engineer the story, I do have to tell you that this story has a happy ending because Congress Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin heard a his story, introduced legislation, bipartisan legislation with Joni Ernst, a Republican from Iowa. And in fact, in her press release, Senator Baldwin said, Aiden's story has inspired me to introduce this legislation. Here's Aiden with Senator Baldwin. And here's the closing story. In the last Congress, in the last House of Representatives, this bill passed on a vote of 356 votes. It'll be reintroduced and probably passed in this Congress. 56 you had taken the kept from sponsoring. This bill is going to become law because of Aiden's story. That's the power of storytelling. Now, at the risk of deconstructing a beautiful story, let me deconstruct it and show you a little bit about what we saw here. What were the stakes here? Well, like most kids, when he's at lunch, my son usually has to spend his entire time. He's losing his, in essence, he's losing his childhood on some levels. So there was a lot at stake here. There was painting the picture. He enjoys basketball, spending time with his friends. His skin is sensitive. He is missing teeth. So you're getting a much more granular picture of what it's like to be this little boy or to be in his family. Element three, there were so many struggles here that we heard all through it. Um, we heard about bullying. Oh, I love the scene where she's describing it, eating food and looking out the window at other kids playing in the playground. I mean, you're in that classroom, you're in that cafeteria with her because she's telling such a good story. Um, the discovery, if they had been in an accident, he would have missing those teeth covered by insurance as if he needed another reason to hate health insurance. And, you know, um, but the point is like, that's shocking. Like, why are some kids with missing teeth able to get their teeth replaced but not hate? That doesn't sound fair. Element number five, what was the we can win? Did you hear her say that phrase? We have the opportunity to. That's what I want you to say when you meet with the lawmaker. I want to hear you say we have the opportunity to and finish that sentence. And her hook was, how far would you get in life without a team? Could you forget that if you're a lawmaker? So what I'm going to have you do is you got a lot of time left in there. I've always been time. You want to go through an exercise. I'm going to reverse up here a little bit so we can show you these seven elements up here. And we can think about them as you build your story. Now, I'm going to ask you to move into um, twos, if possible, three if it doesn't work out in your table. And at first, the way the exercise works is I want you to just tell your story and, and in your own words, not keeping the elements maybe in mind, but really the first draft should be just from the heart. It should just be what you want to talk about. Your colleagues should take notes, knowing what you think and what's the elements you captured. And your colleague would say, okay, I didn't hear a discovery, or I didn't hear you say it, but I have an opportunity to say it. By the way, pick the issue, I should have said at the beginning. Pick the issue, of course, at the beginning, you're going to talk about something that is actionable, measurable, something you can hold the member, member accountable to. So pick that issue, practice with your partner, and then reverse. Okay, spend about 10, 12, 15 minutes doing that. You have more time to do it. This is your first draft. 
could do it now, so that we are practicing later today, you can refine it. Any questions from our audience here? Okay, so pick a pair. Um, if you're in a group of three, like over here, um, just go ahead and have three people work together, okay? Go to Thank you. 
reconvening to the front here. In the house, they say, please cease the bottle of conversation. I never understood what it came out of the conversation. Uh, anyway. All right, now I'm doing this file, and I know that if I ask for a volunteer, no one's going to raise their hand. So I'm simply going to ask, who has a partner that did a good job? Because if you don't raise your hand, your partner's going to think you think they suffer. Okay, since you're playing with each other, okay, great. All right, all right. So, as you know, we are broadcasting this uh, entire webinar as well. I'm going to hand the microphone and I'm going to ask you to state your name first. Okay. And then we'll be. I think it was the first time you've done this, so it's okay to feel uncomfortable. Um, if you get to start, what are you doing? Okay, all right. Okay, so I'm going to hand you the microphone. You can start, and then you'll pass the microphone between you to translate. Okay? Great. Okay. Now, pretend I have a congressman, something I've always wanted to be. I've never had this one. Pretend I'm a congressman, and you're going to practice your story with me, and as if you are actually, again, first time, so it's okay. If you feel uncomfortable, you open it up, that's okay. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Marisa Costa, y estoy aquí exponiendo los situaciones que hay en mi ciudad que me gustaría hacer un cambio. Una de ellas es... Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Apolli, y estoy aquí con Marisa. Marisa es de Naval, Arizona. For those of you who do not know, it is close to the border. And as you've been seeing in the news, what's happening right now? There's a lot of problems with drugs, narcotics, trafficking. Y los dos situaciones que nosotros tenemos en nuestra ciudad. Una es que yo soy uh, caregiver y he cuidado a dos personas mayores. Uh, también mi interés es por los niños de mi ciudad. No hay más que McDonald's para que ellos se entretengan. Y los adultos que a veces sufren parálisis uh, de medio cuerpo, que no pueden caminar, ellos van a Home Depot, donde hay, no hay tanta gente para poder practicar y retomar el poder volver a caminar. Y eso a, a mi vida ha impactado porque la ciudad no está segura. Irá a un centro recreativo afuera por los animales que existen en Arizona. Uh, and to be specific about the trafficking that we we'll discussed, um, let's go ahead and take a look at fentanyl. Fentanyl and cannabis. Fentanyl that attracts children and have access to that fentanyl. Um, I would also like to state that I live in a place that I'm very proud of, good people, but there's a lot of poverty. And what happens when there's poverty and there's no work? Where do they go? They go to work and get access. You can go to sell drugs. Some drugs in skate parks, some drugs in, I don't know, a whole people parking lot, right? And I work as a kid, a caregiver to elders who are physically disabled. This open space that we talk about, you know, honestly, is it really even available or is it causing more danger to my community? I had a woman that I worked with at Nate come up to her and find her. And, um, y como esta situación, me gustaría mucho apoyar a mi ciudad para poder hacer lo que ahora está sucediendo. Los bancos están cerrando. En mi ciudad se un banco. Me gustaría que ese banco se convirtiera en un lugar recreativo por dentro para que las personas mayores entonces están teniendo su situación. Incluso los niños en un parque que tiene abandonado pudieran disfrutarlo allá adentro. La única, la única situación que nos preocupa a todos, porque tanto usted congresista como ustedes tienen hijos, que les preocuparía que los pusieran con pentanilo a vendiéndolos como tú dices, al lugar. Y eso es la mayoría de las situaciones que pasan en mi ciudad. Que a las personas que ya han trabajado en droga, vuelven a la prisión, salen de prisión, por tener antecedentes penales no pueden trabajar. Regresan otra vez a vender drogas. Entonces, es un círculo como los hamsters que están en esa rueda, como dice mi compañera, en un círculo 
que nos pueden salir de ahí porque la situación también no les ayuda mucho. I would like to uh, say that um, I'm going through an issue where I look at places in the private sector like McDonald's who has a playground for children to go and play. And I think like, why is it not possible for you to come and help out and have these spaces where children can go inside and recreate, have elders go ahead and learn how to walk if they're uh, disabled. And I'm going to ask you a question. Why is it that I feel that my community is still in Hampshire that is in a rut, gets stuck, and I cannot continue to get out of this cycle? And you have children, so think about that. Thank you. Okay, let's let's do a little bit. I can learn your name. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, what we missed here just a little bit was the specific accountable acts, which I know the Hispanic Access Foundation is going to work with. Something that you, the members, got to say yes or no to. So that's where you make sure you have something specific in mind that you're going to have an ask. Great job. All right. Who else wants to give this a try? Who's got a partner? You said this partner did a really great job. You really, I see some pointing going on over here. Those guys. Okay. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. Right. You both can go. Grab a microphone because, as I say, we're broadcasting in the webinar format. So, uh, so all right. Yep. So, again, you're going to pretend like you're a member of Congress. Because what's the issue you're going to talk about? No, I know. Thank you. 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 Okay, so then like I'm a member of Congress and you're pitching me whatever you're pitching. Right. So I'm here today to talk about an issue that I've lived personally. I am a model alumni and I formerly worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service through the model project. I got involved a lot with my community that lives, well, that is on the US Mexico border. And so in the time that I was there, I've noticed that the sort of the narrative and the um, general, you know, counterparts that I had within the federal system of conservation was mostly white males. So that seems to have been a monopolized sort of way that the system operates. Um, and I would like to see a change in how we can have more people like me for this community um, reflect what it's really like to be in this part of town. I can see the U.S.-Mexico border where I live, and people that I work with sometimes don't have a uh, conduit to express in a meaningful way why we need to protect these refugees, these green stages, uh, and what's in store for the future, which isn't always uh, a good view. Um, furthermore, I am a father. I have a one year old at home, and when she grows up, I would like her to you know, get to know these places, these beautiful places, beautiful landscapes that we all share. Um, we all sort of have an ownership of. And when she grows up, I wouldn't like to be the only reflection of what this workforce, workforce looks like. I would like her to see that there are other people like her, like myself, that are fighting for um, you know, a greener future and um, that conservation is in good hands. Great. Right. Good job. So again, but you know, we want to have we have the opportunity to choose. We want to have that specific ask in mind so that we can hold the lawmaker accountable. But or even something really well at the beginning. I used to take a training course. Believe it or not, I actually took the Dale Carnegie course in human relations and effective speaking. And the first rule you learn that Dale Carnegie taught us is you have to earn the right to give the speech. You earn the right to give the speech because you started it out. I was in this program. We saw how it worked. That is a really, it's a first person narrative that no one can take from you. And that's really important. If you have that first person narrative, if you're able to describe it from your vantage point, it's something that your national lobbyists cannot do. They can talk facts. Figures, spreadsheets, but only you can tell a story. And that's essential for you to make sure you feel comfortable. So, as you go into the breakout sessions at 3 30, 
I want you to think a little bit more about who, what is the ask and work with Tim others on what the specific ask is you're going to have so that that member of Congress is held accountable. They'll literally are thinking in head, what does this person want me to do? Is it co-sponsor a bill? And sometimes, by the way, the ask may be come visit us and watch and see for yourself. Do you know why the way it's so hard for elected officials or politicians to say no to that? They want to say yes to you. One member of Congress said to me, she said, I think all members of Congress are middle children trying to please their father. It's so true. It is absolutely so true. The middle kids in the world want you. That's right. Yeah. Well, you're a politician. It's that who your members are. They're D and I, A, hard part to you. Will you come and visit with my friends and I, others in our community, in the Dallas, in Utah, in, in Phoenix? It's really hard for them to look you in the eye and say no. They'll say, I'll locate you in, but then you can follow up. So there's a lot of different things. We work with Hispanic access, try to figure out what that is. As I wrap up, I want to leave you with one final quote and one final thought. I realize that for many of us, engaging with a lawmaker is intimidating. That building those relationships over time with their staff seems impossible. But I'll leave you with this quote from Thomas Jefferson, who reminded us that we in America do not have a government by the majority. We have a government by the majority who participate. So I encourage you to go forth and participate, and good luck with your advocacy efforts. I'm not sure what that I <laughs> 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 <laughs>